appreciate the good news that you know. Another aspect is spreading it in love. Of course, sometimes we tell people who come to the evangelism school, if you want to preach to somebody, preach to that person in love. Don't be so antagonistic. Otherwise, the person will kick against whatever you are going to tell the person. Don't tell him you are a sinner. You are this, you are this. Don't do that. What of you that is preaching to him? So spread it in love to others so that they may put their trust in God through Christ. So those are the elements that make up evangelism. I would not talk about elements that promote evangelism. And these include personal persuasion. You need to be persuaded about what you are doing. That there is salvation in no other than Jesus Christ. If you are not really persuaded, you cannot deliver that order. But of course, personal conviction is something that is akin to that. Personal conviction of your own salvation. When you have accepted that you have been saved, that's why you can tell other people and try to convict them or convince them that they need this. Deal. Then, of course, there is this joy in the salvation, bubbling joy of salvation. Are you happy that you are saved? If you are happy, you want other people to come and join you in that, that state of happiness. So that is another element. In that. Then passion for souls. You need to have passion for souls. Hell is not the best place for anybody to go. Not even your enemies should be allowed to go to hell. So if you have passion for souls, you don't want anybody to go to hell. So you have passion for them. Of course you know. Then of course, burden for the unsaved. Are you worried that some people are not saved? Does it perturb you? If it, if it doesn't, then you won't really, you are, not, you are not going to be able to promote evangelism. So you need to have that burden. And then, of course, the working of the Holy Spirit on our hearts to launch out. But let the Holy Spirit be the person leading you to do what you are doing. Because you cannot convict anybody. You can preach from now to 20 years to come, no, nobody will repent. Because he alone convicts the people you have preached to. So you must let him to, uh, let him uh, launch you out to pray to him to give the utterance. Now, uh, uh, our guide, uh, of course, Acts 1 8, we know, we know all that, that particular place in the Bible is a very important place in the Bible. That is the basis of evangelism and that is the basis of missions. We say that missions equals evangelism plus social concern. So, Acts 1 8 is the one that tells us to go out and then get people to do Christ. Listen. Now, let us look at the uh, providential declaration to conquer and possess. Missions is God's heartbeat. Of course, we know. That's why he sent Jesus Christ. Jesus came not just to evangelize. He came to build a church. And that's exactly what he did before he left. And God sent his only son to earth to kickstart missions. He ordered the church to go on missions in the same way he had told Joshua about the unconquered lands during his administration. The church already has God's directive. We are just to, to get his direction on each step we are to take. So missions is what God sent his son to, uh, to the earth to do. And that's exactly what he did. He did. He preached to people. He established a church which is asked Peter to be the, the head of the flock for him. And that's how missions also operate. That's what we are also supposed to be doing to areas that have not been conquered. Like this topic said today, unconquered lands. There should not be any unconquered lands. Because Christ said we should take the gospel to the utmost part, uttermost part of the earth. So policy direction. Um, well, based on the general divine directive on missions, this synod is to come up with policy guidelines. By our, by our own estimation, that's what we think. God policy guidelines to direct on the modalities, to direct on the resources, to direct also on resource development and possibly establish a board to strengthen or, or to strengthen or strengthen the chaplaincy that already exists for concerted missions effort to make missions more more in tune with what this uh, diocese uh, wants to do to be the center stage. Now the diocese is to give a word on local and foreign missions. The timing, the mode of operation, and the broad strategy which they should follow. Uh, concrete decisions on issues raised in this paper would constitute part of the needed policies that we are asking this diocese to develop. Now let's look at the principles directing con conquest and possession. What are these principles? Now, sequel to the policy direction of that policy formulated here, certain principles 
should be put in place to further guide and direct missions both within and beyond this diocese. These include, but are not limited to the following, uh, as we listed there, one resource development, training where needed. You need people to train as missionaries, you need people to train as evangelists, and you need to encourage them to be able to do that job. Then again, we, we need, something has to be done about evangelizing communities. You need to evangelize communities, evangelize even the families and individuals need to be evangelized. Then also, how do you raise the funds? So policies should also guide some of these things. How do you raise the funds? Where and when do you raise the funds? Also, evangelization terms. How do you go about evangelizing, evangelizing conquering these unconquered lands? So let's look at a party determination. Now, it is expedient to put down what may amount of, of, to a code of conduct to people that are going to evangelize, people that are going to organize missions. If you look at Matthew 10, 1 to 15, and Luke 9, 1 to 15, it sort of gives us a guideline, a code of conduct for people who are supposed to go into this area, how they should behave. If you look at that, let me just look at, mention one or two things, a few things that, that those places tell us. One, preach. He told them, preach about the kingdom of God. That's what the mission is all about. It's not about telling people to go and get plenty of money to develop wealth and become all that. Preach about the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus Christ told them. That's what that's what he had them to, to preach about. And also he told them, give freely. This word that they have received, give it to people freely. Don't let people come, they should sow seed before you, you tell them what to do. No. Give what you have gotten from Christ freely to the people. Let them also get it free. Also, he said we should accept hospitality. Not just that we didn't ask us to ask people to pay for what you are giving to them. But if they do give you something, please accept hospitality. Just as they, in the church here, um, hospitality is welcome. Also be polite because you told them greet the people of the house when you go there. Be polite to the people you are evangelizing. And also, uh, but if your words are not received, you should depart that environment. Because it is not your word, it is God's word. So let's look at what the partitioning domain to conquer and possess. Now, if you look at what, uh, if you look at Joshua 13, 7, 7, you see, God asked Joshua to divide the land to the different tribes, even before the lands had been conquered. He said he should divide them among the various tribes, the nine tribes and, uh, of, of, that were available there, divide the land, unconquered lands. So the tribes were to mobilize they were to rise and conquer the land before possessing them. They have been divided. They told them, this, well, these areas belong to you. These areas belong to you. So it's left to you to conquer those areas and possess those areas. Just like Okrika has been given to us here, we need to divide Okrika and conquer every bit of Okrika land. This diocese needs to do that. Now, this strategy may apply to you since God has led this diocese to choose this team and this text. Now, how will this work for you? Now, let us note that it is a faith venture. Possessing something that you don't already have. You haven't conquered. But God said, possess it, take it, divide it, it's your own. This is a faith venture. And all the tribes may not find it equally easy to conquer and possess those lands that were shared unto them. But prayerfully determine how to divide the entire diocesan landscape into the future at the kingries. You can see with the eyes of faith. That's what, exactly also we are, what we are saying. Divide or create a land into various articles. Even those areas that have not received the gospel. Divide them and then know, think of how to build, do things there. He said, discuss details in clergy school. Get volunteers from among them to go on missions in the articles that do not have churches. Bishop uh, to persuade priests. Okay? If it's, if it's what it uh, takes to champion the building of churches, those priests that have that feeling. Also, funding and supporting measures to be put in place to host some of the diocesan programs in those places, and also to hold diocesan crusades after church has been planted in a place to strengthen the young. So that's, these are suggestions we are talking about. Those areas where you haven't possessed, do things that will make people to, to come to you, to come to Christ by organizing programs in some of those areas. Now, people development. 
There's one very important area we think uh, this diocese needs to embark upon. We generally, on a general basis, uh, you need to mobilize, you need to orientate people and also develop them spiritually through programs to arouse their interest and also readiness for everybody in the diocese to buy into this missions project thing. This vision that we're talking about. The entire diocese needs to be mobilized, not just those who are willing to go. And then secondly, the priests themselves, many, many uh, retreats for priests until majority realizes and keys into the missions vision and project of the diocese. So even the priests need some sort of, uh, 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 of uh, mobilization so that they will catch the vision. And become, because not all priests are inclined to missions and evangelism. So if we do that, probably they will now become more interested in that. So to pursue the congregation enlargement for the next five years, because we think that if we continue this, if you do this, your congregations will increase, will enlarge as time goes on. Then, of course, he talked about our deacons to be delivered of parish responsibilities so that they concentrate on championing or planting of churches uh, and congregations enlargement drive in their art deaconries. Then the laity, the laymen of the church, like we, we should develop a strategic plan to raise missionaries, raise financiers of missions, and also to encourage missionary visits. This should be done by lay people. Now, until every parishioner catches the mission's fire, you may not be able to succeed. So we need the laity to be, uh, to be really co-opted into this vision so that they too may join. Because the priest alone cannot conquer the lands of Africa. The laity need to be. There are more laity people than the priest, of course, you know. 98% of the church consists of the laity. Consists of laymen and not the bishop, not the, the, the ordained. So people also, we're talking about the arms and units of the church. We suggest that each fairly strong arm or unit of the church be assigned a missionary at the kingry to help plant churches. Those arms of the churches that are, that are vibrant, that are financially buoyant, to please try and be encouraged to do such things. To raise funds for the work and workers and the assigned at the kingry. Also a reasonable timeline to be given them with close supervision by the decision board. That's another uh, suggestion. So, power demonstration. Now, the gospel according to St. Mark attaches power to the Great Commission. Those who believe will have power to cast out devils. So, you can make them to even do that. So, you have power within you as a missionary, as, a, as an evangelist who is going to do that. But the gospel of, Saint, of, of Luke, of, uh, Mark, of uh, Matthew says, the Great Commission is based on the authority Jesus himself was given. Because Jesus said, all power has been given unto me. I said, so, because of that, I said, therefore, go ye and preach the gospel. Because all power has been given unto me. Because of that, he authorizes us to go. He authorizes us to go. So that's, that's what Matthew said. Now, the Diocese Missions Board or Chaplaincy to ensure and work out how power demonstration can be used to advantage and the glory of God. So the decision board should please try and do that so that it will work out. That it opens doors and it opens people's hearts to accepting Christ. Uh, it has also the propensity of changing negative perception about our church as powerless. People think the Anglican church cannot do some of these things. They don't, they don't believe that we can do that. And I think we can even do that better than those who have been doing it, who think they do it better. So if we venture into it, we will do it a lot better than they are already doing. So these five finger posture and gifting encapsulate power, which we must rise to use. Power pulls out crowds, and now, through groaning, intense prayers, now, of course, this is achievable, just like I said earlier. If we start to do this, we will find that very soon we will be able to overtake those who have been doing. Now, very often, power partnership is part of what we also, that's part of the reason we came here, because we want to partner with this uh, diocese, as we are doing with some other dioceses. Now, very often, manpower is a huge challenge. It's good we have said a lot of these things, but who are the people to go and do these things? And if you don't get the people who can do them, then you cannot achieve them. But sadly, manpower challenge lingers when 
and where Christians fail to realize and utilize the divine resources available. We have some, some places available that can help us to grow in this aspect of evangelization and missions work. Now, for instance, there are missions agencies that can provide resources, such as men, such as materials and methods, the training and advice that we do in Elmi, and even money. So Elmi can partner with this diocese, my Lord Bishop, that um, we can partner with this diocese on an annual basis. You know, we join a diocese, and, uh, a diocese annually in their annual uh, uh, outreach, when they do their outreach, we usually partner with one diocese at a time every year to do annual outreach for them. We can also reach that agreement with this diocese. And you can get as much as you want. God helping us, we'll be able to provide a lot of support for this diocese, a way of training people, and any other way you think we can help uh, uh, plan uh, this work of uh, evangelism and missions. So going, grooming, and guiding can be done with this diocese. We will come if you want us to be here. We will groom your people if you want to send them to them. And we we'll guide them also. We we'll assist in whatever way in order to fulfill the most important work that our Lord Jesus Christ asked the church to do. That is evangelization. Thank you and God bless my lovely bishop. Thank you, Prof. Please, it is now open for discussion, questions, contributions, reactions for the next 30 minutes. Please, the communication stroke pastoral later committee, get ready immediately after now for your first reading. Lord Bishop, all other protocols duly observed. Um, we thank you, uh, guest lecturer, on mission and evangelism. The issue of mission and evangelism, I think, is something that has been going on for a very long time. People go out to reach out to people, inviting people, sending trust, and all of that. But in recent time, I come to discover we have much more challenge before us. A situation where you find um, people of the same faith, possibly of the same church, who rise from the rank and file and then now come to discover that what they have been studying over the years might not be true. And come up with, uh, well, let's say new theology, profound theor theories around the Bible. So to confuse and cause, you know, confusion in the minds of people who have believed over the years. And so I'll give you a few instances. For example, we are talking about evangelism, winning of souls. At the global level, at the global church, in particular in Anglican church, um, recent time you discover, people who have been in faith for a very long time later discover there is nothing wrong with gay marriage. And then go ahead to wed them or give them place in the house of God. At other time, you discover that um, a professor in religious studies, a man of God, a servant of God, a priest, studied African traditional religion and eventually became a professor and discovered that African traditional religion offers more blessing than even Christianity. Right in the heart of the church, divided the church. So, with the understanding of a lot of inventions, new understanding of the word of God, translation, transliteration, we are having more confusion in the minds 
of those who listen to us. What other new strategies can we go back? Can we come up with so to work together in synergy to propagate the gospel of the kingdom? Because I see a more confused state of mind of our congregation and of our church. And I pray that the Lord will help us. Thank you. It's okay. Let me just say something on the issue raised. You know, in one of Jesus' parables, it made us to understand that after the soya finished sowing, he went back to sleep. And it was while he was sleeping that the enemy came and planted tars. Over the years, if we can go back to the history of the church, there are times and seasons as it we are when the church went to sleep. First, Turkey we are talking about today that has become an Islamic stronghold was the Asia Minor that John wrote his letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. It's the present day Turkey that has become an Islamic state. What happened? How come that Islam that came into existence about 600 years after the existence of the church within a short period took over the present day Turkey and the entire North Africa St. Cyprian of Carthage that said where there is no bishop there is no church one of the church fathers we celebrate was from North Africa in fact outside a council in Jerusalem the first ecumenical council of the church took place in North Africa but where is North Africa in Christianity today the church went to sleep and the enemy is always awake you know anytime i study the book of esther there is something that challenges me when Amon made up his mind to destroy mordecai and the jews bible said he cast power for how many moons for 12 months for 365 or 66 days daily he was consulting the national juju of the land to give him a date and a time when the jews can be destroyed he was doing that every day religiously what was the church doing at that time supposing there was nobody like mordecai what do you think will have happened the confusions we are having in the world basically are taking place i believe because the church has gone to sleep again what is the church doing with our teaching ministry how effective is the church in our teaching ministry how committed how dedicated are members of the church in the teaching ministry in one of my daily devotionals i wrote that the purposes of jesus teaching is not for him to Thank you. 
Jesus is teaching me this way, I will be defeated. And if all of us at a church, we are doing what we're supposed to do, the enemy may not have that chance to come and sow the tiles he's sowing amongst us. One of the reasons why the, uh, the Islamic movement took over present-day Turkey, the northern and uh, northern Africa, was because the church abandoned evangelism and went into theological debate. The church went into theological debate every day. They are trying to come form of creed or the other, their main focus, their interest and their strength was focused on propounding sacred truths, systematical sacred truths. So they are coming up with the creed, this heresy has spring up, how do we counter it? So there will be a theological convocation and the brains of the church will gather together to argue, to reason at the end of the day, come up with a creed. And so when the church was fighting this battle against heresy, Islam was what? Advancing. Islam was advancing. The enemy has his own way of distracting the church. It was a distraction, serial distraction from within the church. And at the end of the day, the result is that we have Islam to contend with. Homosexuality. Now, is it a subject for debate? In the first place, should we consider it as a subject for debate? No. It is an abomination. We should not give it a consideration. But look at the energy we are giving to homosexual debate. If we, if we put that energy into missions and evangelism, I believe it will yield us more profit than what we are in our time to Recently, an Anglican bishop in Tukia also came up to begin to doubt the, the virgin that the resurrection all the things into the church modernism and the postmodern culture that we have to contend with as a church and that is why anytime i see us we are not taking this christianity serious it beats my imagination because the devil the enemies of the church they are serious with their mission it is only the church that is not serious with our mission. It is only the church. All the enemies of the church, they are serious. And if any man is serious in the church, with the mission of the church and with the mission of the gospel, we tag him, we label him, we give him names. We give our names. We say all sort of things about that person. I want to also strongly believe that there are more enemies of the church within the church than outside the church. It is a problem. But to answer the question the Venerable Father raised, the way and manner we are to approach this so that we will not create more confusion in the brains of men is to teach them the simple truth of the gospel message don't present the gospel message in a sophisticated manner hello don't believe like the gnostics that believed that you need to have an an abstract knowledge something more than the natural in order to comprehend and to understand god no just present this gospel message in the most clearest and simplest manner that people will receive and understand. And when once they receive or understand it, they will run with it. But when you come to present the gospel, you use grammar. 
and confuse the people the more eh? sometimes you know some of us when we are preaching or teaching when we come to concepts that even we ourselves we don't understand we say you know these things have some theological implication no theological implication the truth is that he don't even understand what you are teaching again preach simple message teach simple knowledge guide the people right encourage them to have faith in the lord i think they will not miss their part thank you very much Lord, missions and evangelism, the heartbeat of God, has been so discussed widely. And uh, I think, my Lord, we need to come to this point where Jesus Christ told his disciples. In Acts of Apostles, chapter 1, verse 8, he said, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. We need to come to the point of power in our churches. You said something in the morning, and I think it's very, very true and it's correct we need to conquer ourselves to be able to conquer the unconquered grounds and it's the power of God it's the Holy Spirit that will conquer us as a church we need to completely accept some of us up till today don't even believe that there is something like the Holy Spirit that the church should move with that should come upon the church the holy spirit is the one that will make and will remake us to conquer the unconquered grounds thank you my lord any other one contribution questions it's okay sir okay so before you let's take one more i want to thank god for this uh, topic on missions and evangelism like my brother said i think we should have a teaching about the holy spirit we are just scratching i think my lord bishop should have time for us to know about him Without him, there is no church. We just read the creed. There are things we're supposed to know about the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues, to know about him, a personal relationship with him, is beyond speaking in tongues. And until the church knows who the Holy Spirit is, he is our companion. We have to commune with him relate with him until you have an in-depth knowledge of him then evangelism shall be very effective you know something you would we need to know the man the chief evangelist in ourselves in the church and i pray that the bishop may have time so that we should have um study more study about the holy spirit thank you very much Thank you. Swala, come to the front. Praise the Lord. Um, I'd like to again thank uh, Lord Bishop for inviting us to this seminar. If you take time to go through this paper, 
you will observe that some practical steps have been listed out. And I don't want us to fall into the risk of being sidetracked. If, for example, there are some of the suggestions made here or recommendations made which we don't agree with or we don't understand, we are here now. Put us onto the firing squad and fire us. We have listed out steps that can be taken to really actualize the theme of this synod. And that theme is much land to be possessed. We are brought here to help the synod, you know, uh, try to think of how to possess that much land that has not been possessed. And we've taken time to list out steps here. We have talked about policy guidelines from the diocese. We've talked about, you know, taking some various arms of the church, giving them assignments to go to the field and preach the gospel, establish churches. And I tell you, in our Anglican church, we have lots and lots of resources that are wasting. Nothing stops us, for example, from telling the Council of Knights, this is your area of focus. Go and establish churches. Go to the Youth Fellowship. This is your own area of focus. Do that. And then go to the CMF. This is your area. Mother's Union and the WG. This is your own area. And by the time you give them those kind of assignments, you will definitely see people who are on fire for the gospel. And then we have also listed out here that one of the things that can, you know, frighten people away from getting involved in evangelism is when they are not trained. Somebody doesn't know his left from his right, and you are telling him to go and do something. He will find all tenable excuses to give to you, and you will not do it. So we've also listed out the need for training of people, and we thank our fathers in God here in the ministry. If our bishop, for example, has, we believe God has given him that vision, but he has mapped them out, he can also begin to use our fathers in God here to achieve it. So what we are saying here is that there is need to move out. But it is because, you know, passion for evangelism has died down. That's why you find that men sleep on the pews when you come to service on Sundays. Because that passion is no longer there. But here we are today. The essence of coming here is to help rekindle that passion. Today we hear about the new, new churches, you know, and we see people trooping into the new, new churches. Let me ask us, what do they have that we do not have? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And I agree with that. But I want to also say that we on our own may beat the Holy Spirit to silence. And then when we become, I mean, when the, it's as if the Holy Spirit has gone to sleep, you find that, I mean, business as usual will return. But we are looking at a situation where people will really agonize on their knees to pray for souls. Let me ask us, when last did we do that? I told my team when we started initially in 1993, and the name came up for Great Anglican Revival Team, 
The day we had time to discuss it, I said, sir, I'm sorry, I may not agree with this name. They say, why, why, why? I said, the great Anglican revival team, the fire is on now. And churches we are being established, crusades we are being held. How, suppose there comes a time when the team, I mean, the revival inside the team had died down. Who will revive the team? And that's what we have suffered in our Anglican church. But we believe and trust God that that fire will be rekindled again. And the Holy Spirit himself will begin to demonstrate his power in his church. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You want to say something? Thank you very much, sir. On behalf of the Diocese of Okrika, we stand to thank you and the Prof for coming to share with us in this, our Synod. Thank you very much. The good Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. All right. Now that we are done with the seminar, I think uh, we can just say a little about the Holy Spirit, something that is raised, and maybe also discuss the issue of the church's finance, maybe in the next 15 minutes before we take the communique, then take the revival hour and close for the day. Just turn with me to First Thessalonians chapter 5 and read verses 19 and 20. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 19 and 20. All right. New King James said, Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Those two verses, are they relevant? Yes. Do not quench the spirit. Which means the spirit in you can be quenched. The spirit in me can be quenched. The spirit in the church can be quenched. For this reason, Apostle Paul advises us or encourages us not to quench the Holy Spirit. There are so many things we do as a people and as a church to quench the Holy Spirit. First, we quench the Holy Spirit by our sinful acts. Sin is one basic thing that quenches or silences the Holy Spirit in us. Number two, we deliberately come up with traditions, with ideas, with structures that quenches the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a dynamic spirit. It chooses to operate any form, any way he wants to what? Operate. But unfortunately, some of us, we have brought out bottles. We have put the Holy Spirit in the bottle. And we have said to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, listen now. This is the shape you must take. In all circumstances and situations. And when once the Holy Spirit is not taking the shape we have given to him, even when he is speaking to us, we are not what? Listening. 
You know that? And that is where we have the basic problem in the church. It is not that we don't know about him. As Orthodox Christians, every year we dedicate a day unto him and we call it with some tide. Abby? It is a day for the Holy Spirit. We chant him in our canticles. We sing him in our hymns. We read him from our Bible. And we celebrate him on the feast of Pentecost. Yet most of us don't believe or some of us don't believe in his existence and in his operations. Maybe we are not open to his movement. And up to now, we are not ready to open our hearts unto him. It is a problem. Actually, Jesus came to establish a church. And he did establish a church, the church, in his death and resurrection. But the church was only inaugurated on the day of what? Pentecost. The church was only inaugurated on the day of Pentecost. It is not today that the church will decide and say that we no longer need the Holy Spirit. We have listened to your suggestions. We have heard you. But I believe strongly that every one of us here, we know of him. Maybe we have not encountered him. Maybe we have not, or not all of us have experienced him. But we know of him. And I believe strongly that if you are open enough, if you allow yourself to be assessed by him, you will encounter and experience him. But remember, one way that we quench the Holy Spirit is by despising prophecies. What I mean by despising prophecies, any work of the Holy Spirit, you look down on it. You make caricature of it. Then you are despising him. You are not just only despising prophecies. You are despising him. You don't understand what is happening. And because you don't understand, you look down at it and you criticize it. Paul, while speaking to the church at Corinth concerning the movement of the Holy Spirit, he spoke to a point, he said, these are what? Spiritual things. And he said, the carnal man lacks what? Understanding. The carnal man lacks understanding. The, some years ago, I was pastoring one church, and one day my treasurer came to me, and he looked at me, and he said, Sir, do you know that if one is not educated, one cannot really be an Anglican? But do you believe that? I said, why? He said, you know, in the Anglican church, there are so many things to study, so many things to learn. You have the Bible to contend with, you have the book of common prayer, you have the hymn book, you have the constitution. Every time they are talking about one book or the other. And I saw reasons with him, and that was why even in the olden days, for our parents to be able to understand what the church is doing they were taught the abbd in this church so that they will be able to read the okrika test and to sing the hymns in our language but i don't know the passion the devotion of our forefathers had when it comes to studying to know if the present generation still has that passion Again, how many of us are willing to actually teach 
the present generation. So many of us, we have become busy, including church workers. We have become busy that we don't even have the time to teach our congregation. Some of us, we have not even taught ourselves. We have not studied, according to Apostle Paul saying to Timothy, study to show yourself a workman that has been what? Approved by God. We have not studied to that level that God is now approved of us. We can stand at any time to teach. And when we are teaching, we are rightly dividing the word of truth. We must come to that level. Bible says, Jesus said, that when the Holy Spirit comes, it will what? Remind you of the things that I have taught you. Which means first and foremost, you must learn for the Holy Spirit when you needed it most to what? Bring it into your remembrance. But for more, some of us, we have become too lazy when it comes to studying, personal studying. We have become too lazy. We don't study. Some of us, we no longer preach new messages. No new sermon. Some of us will read limited books. If I sit down, you are preaching. If you are, the base of your sermon is, is from Matthew Henry, I will know. Because I know his language. If it is the life application Bible you use, I will know. If it is life in the spirit you use, I will know. The different study Bibles you are using, I will know. So what are we saying? Beyond these commentaries, you need to also form your own opinion. Huh? Beyond these commentaries, you need to also come form your own opinion under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Most of the things I stand before you to talk about were things that I studied 25 years ago. But sometimes when I stand to speak, the Holy Spirit just brings them to my remembrance. And I begin to talk about them as if I just read them yesterday. you need to be accessible by the Holy Spirit. That is the most important thing. When once he can assess you, you will not have problem. Oh, maybe God helping us have some systematic study on the person of the Holy Spirit. I must confess, I'm not a systematic theologian, but I believe in more practical theology than systematic theology. Because I see systematic theology has the systematic presentation of sacred truths. If you just present them and you are not practicing them. So I believe more in practical theology than in systematic theology. Thank you. Uh, Chief Benson raised an issue. Our churches being impoverished and our inability to do what? Pay our workers salary. A divine of old, I did not even meet him in the ministry, but when I came into the Anglican clerical ministry in
Amada se grime, 
bene la mia bombe in cielo